Okay, the um, Board of Trustees public session is now called to order. Can I hear a motion to approve the agenda, please? Moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Do I hear any discussion about the agenda? Hearing none, uh, Amanda, would you please call the roll for the approval of the agenda? Trustees, when I call your name, please state your vote. Chair Moore? Approved. Vice Chair Uvula? Approved. Trustee Chen? Approved. Trustee Johnson? Approved. Trustee Price Jones? Approved. Trustee Stanton Buttram? Approved. Trustee Salpi Rodriguez? Approved. Trustee Curran? Approved. Thank you. Chair Moore, this motion passes. Thank you very much, Amanda. So welcome everyone um, to our meeting tonight. And I would like to say probably for the first time in over two years, every single trustee is here in <laughs> present, in person, and I'm just delighted. So thank you to all of our trustees. It isn't always easy, so you're very much appreciated. And thank you to all of you out there as well who attend these meetings. I think it's wonderful. So the next item, item on our agenda is, um, for our, is the consent agenda, which consists of the approval of the minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion about the minutes? Hearing none, Amanda, would you call the roll for the consent agenda, please? Trustees, when I call your name, please state your vote. Chair Moore? Approved. Vice Chair Uvula? Approved. Trustee Chen? Approved. Trustee Johnson? Approved. Trustee Price Jones? Approved. Trustee Stanton Buttram? Approved. Trustee Zalpi Rodriguez? Approved. Trustee Curran? Approved. Thank you. Chair Moore, this motion passes. Thank you very much. We'll next move on to the uh, board committee reports. I just have a few comments. Um, this afternoon, right before the public session, um, every member of the board of trustees met with uh, Dr. Uh, Claudia Schaefer, uh, Schrader. I want to call her Schaefer. I apologize. Dr. Claudia Schrader, um, which was our preliminary visit for the uh, site visit, which is coming up in um, in March of next year, and it was um, all eight members sat with her and discussed the upcoming site visit. And I want I would just like to say I felt the pride in the group I was in for this college and everything that you're doing here. So it was it's a great point of pride to actually have the Middle States Accreditation Team come so that we can show off. <laughs> so um, I think that's wonderful. Um, over the past month, we have had the first meeting of our new uh, Student Achievement Committee, which we're not sure yet what it, if that's going to be its final name. But I was delighted that we had a very robust discussion of what the charter should look like and what the title of the uh, committee should be. And you're going to hear a report about this from Trustee Chen in a few moments. I'd also like to thank everyone here who worked be behind the scenes for this one-day preliminary meeting with um, Dr. Schrader. That's Claudia Schrader. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it, from my point of view, it went off without a hitch. I think you all should be very proud. There's so many of you who were involved in what happened today, and you made us look great. So thank you. Thank you very much. So the next um, uh, re committee report will be from Trustee Price Jones for the Board Development Committee. Good afternoon. Uh, the Board Development Committee met on October 5th and reviewed the responses to the self-assessment surveys and discussed plans of uh, action, including updating a document uh, that we currently have that outlines, outlines roles and responsibilities, workshops, and professional development and a retreat. As part of the 2022 and um, 2022 to 2023 board goals, 
The committee suggests that the Board of Trustee members participate in a diversity, equity, and inclusion training in January 2023. Committee members recommend that the Board of Trustee members attend a workshop on healthy communication to deepen understanding of ourselves and others. And the committee also approved the 2022-2023 Goal Completion Tracking Form and was provided to all board members to help track completion of goals. In an effort to welcome new board of trustee members and reinforce expectations, the committee suggests a board retreat in August of 2023. The committee will follow up with dates and details. Um, Chairman Moore, this concludes my report. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Trustee Price Jones? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next uh, committee report. Uh, Trustee Stanton Buttram for the Human Resources Committee Report. Uh, thank you, Chairman. The Human Resources Committee met on September 22nd via Zoom. Thank you. And uh, during the meeting was discussed the benefits open enrollment, uh, the Human Resources Information System, as well as a new collective bargaining legislation, which took effect on September 1st. Um, for the online benefits, there is a new online benefits portal called Benelogic, which uh, was discussed with the committee. Um, there's also a new applicant tracking system called Page Up, um, which will allow candidates to be able to uh, submit their applications online. Um, for benefits, uh, Anne Arundel County also partners with the college, um, so that's a part of the benefit system. For the calendar year 2023, there will be an increase in the health plan costs, but there will be a decrease in dental and vision costs. And open enrollment has started. It will continue through the month of October. Uh, we also received an update on collective bargaining, um, which, as I stated, took effect on September 1st. And that concludes my report, Chair Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Stanton Buntrip. Does anyone have any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next committee report, which are from uh, Trustee Chen, our Student Achievement Committee. Thank you, Chairman Moore, Chairwoman Moore. Um, the Student Achievement Committee met on September 21st by Zoom. As a result of the board assessment survey, the board has recommended a new ad hoc committee that focuses on understanding the educational programs and student services that affect student success and outcomes at the college. The committee met, as I said, on September 21st to discuss the committee charter, committee name, and possible reports and topics to review for future meetings. The committee had a robust discussion, <laughs> as Chairman Moore said, about what the proposed name and charter should be, being mindful that the board focuses on the policies related to student success and not the operations. The committee also received a brief overview of academic affairs in the Division of Learning and student affairs in the Division of Learner Support Services. At the next meeting on November 17th, the committee will finalize the committee name and charter, as well as discuss specific areas it would like to receive updates from the college on at future meetings. This concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Chen. Are there any questions? Hearing none, uh, I will call on Trustee Uvula for the Anne Arundel Community College Foundation report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to start off my report with uh, a donor thank you letter that will be shared with us by Trustee Curran. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Dear donor, thank you for the Pathways to Credit Studies Scholarship. This scholarship will help me pay for my classes and continue my education here at ACC. I have type 1 diabetes, and so does my twin sister, which can be very difficult and expensive for our family. It's hard, but we try our best to get around it by holding down multiple jobs 
to try to be able to pay for college. Your support will allow me to focus on school and my goal for becoming a speech and language pathologist. So far, my experience at AACC has been great. As a first-generation college student, I had no idea what to expect going into college. I have learned to push myself, and I'm finding out my passion in the process. I'm letting my, I'm letting my strongest classes help me guide me to my ideal career path. Mm -hmm. A career in speech, speech pathology will allow me to work with individuals to help with them feel more comfortable and to express themselves. I'm interested in working with everyone who needs help whether they are young children, older adults, or have special needs. Once again, thank you very much for awarding me this scholarship. It truly means so much to my family. I never thought I would ever be awarded a scholarship. It left me speechless when I was notified. Thank you so much for investing in my future. On a personal note, I think this is really important as, a, as someone who has went through speech pathology uh, when I was very young. Um, so I appreciate the foundation working on this. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Kern. Uh, fundraising update. As of September 30th, 2022, the foundation's fundraising total is just over 1.2 million against a fiscal year goal of uh, 2 million. Uh, fundraising initiatives. The AACC Foundation Board met on September 28th. At the meeting, the board accepted the foundation's fiscal year 2022 audited financial statements. Um, in addition, the board voted to increase the threshold for establishing a new annual scholarship at AACC from $2,500 to $5,000. The $2,500 threshold has been in place for over 20 years, and in looking at scholarships, uh, uh, recent scholarships, most of them have $5,000 or, or greater. Uh, this change is part of the overall strategy of building a privately funded scholarship uh, program that can provide timely support to prospective and current students. Uh, the AACC Foundation is working to strike an appropriate balance between customization of scholarship criteria and scalable scholarships that can be awarded efficiently when current and prospective students need them the most. The Foundation currently has five general scholarships that donors can fund with any gift amount. Uh, events. The foundation is hosting a donor engagement event on Thursday, November 3rd from 5 to 6.30 p.m. in the Health and Life Sciences Building to showcase how AACC is addressing the shortage of healthcare workers in our community. Uh, Dean Elizabeth a a Apple will be conducting tours of the building for guests. You should have received an invitation in the mail, and if there are any prospective donors who you believe should be invited to this event, please contact Molly Melson. Uh, we hope you can join us uh, for this important event. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Uvala. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I will turn this over to Dr. Lindsay for the President's report. Thank you. It's been a really busy fall semester already with many more events and activities to come in just this month alone. Uh, as you know, today the college hosted Dr. Claudia Schrader, the chair of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education Evaluation Team, who visited our Arnold campus as well as the Rundle Mills and the Glen Burnie Town Center locations. Um, and I have to say she's very interested in our dealer school. Um, many thanks to Dr. Greg Schrader, the steering committee, and all of the other committee members and volunteers who helped plan and organize this event. I do think that there's a lot to celebrate. And when I had my individual meeting with Dr. Schrader, she was very complimentary of the work the college has done. So I wanna make sure that the college community gets the credit for what they're bringing forward to the board. Um, we're also going to be hosting some very high profile events and speakers this month. Um, I'd like to start out by talking about um, Consul Rafael Lafiaga, who was introduced to me by uh, Luis Borgunda several years ago. He's the uh, Deputy Secretary of State. Um, Consul La Laviaga is head of the consular section at the Embassy of Mexico in Washington, D.C., and he's actually agreed to come here tomorrow to do um, a lecture for us on Hispanic Heritage Month and we'd like to thank Dr. Milner for facilitating that, um, that lecture. The college is also hosting the League of Innovation for fall, um, for in the fall for the board meetings next week, October 19th through the 20th. Um, please note that all board members and their spouses or significant others are invited to attend the dinner on October the 19th at the Annapolis Yacht Club. I'd like to thank Trustee Uvalis for, for sponsoring us um, and getting us into that lovely location for our um, League of Innovation board meeting. 
Um, we're also going to be talking, obviously, about some of the highlights from our college. Um, AACC's Open House, a college-wide event to show off the great things the college is doing, will be held on October 20th at the Arnold campus. Um, we will also be hosting Dr. Mark Fidel, the new superintendent of Anne Arundel County Public Schools, for a leadership event sponsored by Leadership Anne Arundel on October the 26th. I have had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Fidel, and he is incredibly supportive of an increased partnership with us and the community college. And yeah, he said he, you spoke. With, did you speak with him? Or? On whether uh, yeah, <laughs> he's um, he's very very interested, and he's got a lot of energy, and he has a. One of his own um, kids is involved in the uh, community college, looking at the community college, but currently involved with the high school system. So he's very invested in us. Um, and he seems to be incredibly supportive of growing our relationship e even deeper. I'd also like to share that Chair Moore, Dr. Kelly McCants-Price, and I will be presenting at the Association for Muni Community College Trustee Leadership Congress October 26th through 29th on AACC's model course program and its success in reducing equity gaps. Trustee Price Jones will also be joining us at the conference as well. Uh, last Friday, I had the opportunity to present at the other AACC Future Leaders Program, um, talking about our planning with strategic planning, equity, and the board, and how the three of those things mesh together. So that was a fun, fun event. There's a lot more information and details in my um, written report, such as information on National Disability Employment Awareness Month, coming out week activities, which is something that will make some people in here very excited, a new pathway for our students to attain their doctorate of pharmacology degree with Howard University in six years. This is the first time we've had this opportunity for our students, so six years to a doctorate in pharmacology with much thanks to the um, all the work that the faculty have done on articulation agreements and getting our faculty What's through. What's the name of the, of the group that they're partnering with? Howard University. I know, I knew. <laughs> did you not hear me say, did you not hear me say there's some people that are going to really be interested in this? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't wonder by making a guess that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have something to do with our support? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that includes my abbreviated report. Again, there is a written report in the board agenda for uh, additional details, and certainly ask me if there's any additional questions. Um, at this point in time, I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Tanya Milner, our provost, who will be introducing two of the individuals that will be reporting out on the sabbaticals. Um, I do want to share with the board that the college is very, very grateful for the support that you give to our faculty to have the opportunity to do sabbaticals. And part of the process is once the sabbatical is approved by the board is to report back to the board the results of the sabbatical um, to hopefully continue to you know continue your support um, and appreciation for the work that our faculty do on sabbaticals. So I know Dr. Milner has a timer. And we've said five minutes. <laughs> I told them five I do, I do minutes, and I'm my taking board one of those minutes to introduce them. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the, the first who will come up to uh, present is Dr. Garrett Brown. Uh, Dr. Garrett Brown is a professor of English at AACC. Since 2011, he has helped students at AACC develop their own artistic voice by teaching courses in creative writing, composition, poetry, and writing for the stage and screen. Dr. Brown has said there is a genuine generosity among the students at AACC. I see this in creative writing workshops and at coffee house open mic events. The students at this college support each other, lift each other up, and encourage each other to find and be themselves. The arts teach us how to hone our experience of life and appreciate the world around us. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Garrett. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Milner. Um, I was going to introduce myself, but I guess I don't have to now. So. Uh, I'm Garrett Brown. Uh, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, I teach English and creative writing here at the college. I'm primarily a poet, although I work in various genres of creative writing and composition as well. My sabbatical provided me for an opportunity to take a step back and reimagine both my work here at the college as well as my own creative work. I tackled three different projects during my sabbatical leave. I designed a course in 21st century American poetry. I reimagined the English department's writer's reading series that brings professional writers here to the college. And I reimagined my own work as a poet and where that work could go. 
I'm incredibly excited and proud of the work that I did designing English 285, the special topics course in 21st century American poetry. From the research that I've done, I don't believe that there is a class like this anywhere else. Uh, not at College Park, not at Towson, not at Hopkins. Uh, most colleges simply tack on 21st century poetry to the back of their modernism class, and so they offer a general uh, you know, modern and contemporary poetry survey class. And to me, that approach seems uh, profoundly wrong. It ignores the cultural break of 9-11 and the Iraq war and the poetry that came out of that moment. It ignores the rise of digital platforms like Instagram where poetry has found a new home. It ignores the rise of performance poetry as a legitimate and distinct form of art. Um, I have Amanda Gorman up there that, uh, who's featured in the class because she's both a poet who writes both for the page and the stage. You know, she crosses both of those genres. And it also ignores the rich diversity of voices that are the hallmark of our current cultural moment. Journalists like to say that journalism is the, the first draft of history. And I kind of think of this course as giving students the opportunity to write the first draft of the literary history of the 21st century. Uh, the work I did for writers reading uh, was really kind of about diversifying uh, the writers that we invite to the college. And I think of that both in terms of racial diversity and diversity of genre, but I also think of that in terms of like who the writers that we invite to the college appeal to. And so, for example, our first writer uh, this past September was Ed Doyle Gillespie. He's both, both a poet and a Baltimore City police officer. Uh, the event was very well attended, and we had both uh, English students in the audience as well as uh, uh, cadets from AACC Police Academy. So it was a, a fun mix of people. Our, uh, our next event is coming up uh, Tuesday, October 25th, and we'll feature Jessica Dahl, who's a a historical novelist. Uh, finally, my sabbatical gave me the opportunity to delve into new work and to complete a book-length manuscript of poems, which I've titled Zenith. Uh, the sabbatical provided me the mental space to not only write the new work, but to also figure out uh, kind of where my current work was going. Um, the, you know, I've been writing these kind of nostalgic pieces about old technology, flip phones, and old arcade games, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but I was really kind of struggling to find a thematic center for, like, for that work. Like, what did I want to say about that? It was a lot of kind of good imagery, and I could make good sort of pretty poetry out of it. But like, what was it actually like doing? Uh, the work that I found emerging during my sabbatical was really kind of rife with anxiety, uh, which probably makes sense given what was, what was happening in the world. Um, you know, there was the pandemic, there was the January 6th insurrection, there's the ongoing climate crisis, and it just, you know, it really felt like all of our institutions and ways of thinking, um, and it still feels that way, they just feel very, very fragile. Uh, combining that anxiety with my interest in old technology uh, produced a lot of the poetry in the manuscript, including the, the title poem, Zenith, which I have up here. This is just sort of one section of a, a longer poem. Um, but it's both kind of an ode to those old cabinet stereo systems, you know, the big ones that took up like half your living room and the like. Um, and also a meditation on what it might mean to be like at the zenith of, of a civilization or a, a movement of thought or, you know, however you want to think about it. Doing this kind of work is critical both to me as an artist and as an educator. You know, I'm continually asking my students in creative writing to, to take risks, to try new approaches, uh, to dig deeper into what they're doing. And it's really hard to ask students to do that when you're not doing that yourself. And so I really thank the Board of Trustees for the opportunity to, to do that. And, um, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, Madam Chair, certainly. Am I allowed to ask Dr. Brown a, oh, a question? Certainly. Be my guest. <laughs> no, I really love your poem at the end of your materials, um, Sparrow. Oh, oh, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about it? And, sure. Um, and what is the meaning of the sparrow? Uh, it's funny because sparrow is really thrown in there as an example of 
uh, just of language, right? I mean, if you tell me you believe in words, hyphen, sparrow, um, and the, you know, that poem emerged out of uh, visiting an old friend, an old childhood friend, um, and, and it was sort of steeped, again, sort of in this anxiety, as well as, um, you know, visiting a childhood friend always kind of connects you with your own kind of aging as well. Um, and so, you know, that notion of like, do we, do we believe in the same things that we used to believe in? And I think that's a, you know, it is like the question I think that, that poets ask, you know, like, do we, do we believe in language? Does language do something? Does it have meaning? And so that poem is really kind of a, an exploration of that question. I loved it. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Are you good? Anyone else? No? Thank you for enlightening us a lot with your poems and everything else. And it's really difficult sometimes to get that mute. I am just excited that the sabbatical not only created a lot of synergy for you, but that you're able to impart it back not only to the students, but also to the community. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Doc, Dr. Jacqueline Gambone. She is a professor of education at AACC. Her research focuses on critical thinking and engagement strategies for educators. As a former public school teacher, teaching pre-service and in-service teachers is part of her life's purpose. In her classes, she brings empathy, understanding, and fun to each of her students. She treasures the community at AACC and gives back by being part of the coaching program. Please allow me to welcome Dr. Jackie Gambone to the podium to discuss her efforts. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Milner. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. First, I just wanna say thank you because even though this was many moons ago, and I'll explain that in a moment, <laughs> I had such an incredible experience that actually morphed into something so different that it had originally started with. And it's because my sabbatical started when I found out, well, I, I, it started when I found out I was five days pregnant with my son, and then it was COVID. So my sabbatical was all about, I really wanted to go into different types of schools. I wanted to go to schools that really didn't have a grading system because I, was in my own classes thinking, gosh, I'm grading and assessing and taking off minus one, you didn't do this right, minus five, you didn't do this right, minus 10, this wasn't right, and it just was not impactful for me, and when I stopped doing that for a moment and had a conversation with my students, and I said, what do you feel like when I say grades? What do you feel like with the points? And they just opened up and started, I mean, they were just saying how much grades stress them out, that all they care about is the points and they wanna pass and they wanna you know, just kind of check a box and move on. And for me, I said, well, where's the intrinsic motivation? Where is the, the passion behind the learning and the enthusiasm for the subject matter? And I feel a bit lucky because I teach future educators and current educators and I believe they come to me with a bit, if not a lot, of intrinsic motivation to do what they want to do to get into the classroom. And they still were so concerned with the grade. So in my sabbatical, I said, I really want to investigate what these other schools, Montessori, Sudbury schools, Waldorf, what are they doing to encourage a true love for learning instead of focusing on the grade where effort and feedback practices become more of the fabric of how they learn. And what was really interesting in some of my focus groups, I'm so grateful I'm a Virgo and got so much done before COVID, uh, <laughs> but I found that when I went in to talk to Montessori students, for example, and I said, what are you, what, what's going on with your school day? What's happening today? They were going on and on and on. They were using the Pythagorean theorem to build a chicken coop, for goodness sake. And then I went into a high school and I said, tell me about your day, what are you doing? And they're like, well, I just got an A on my science paper. And I said, say more about that. 
So I had to dig a lot deeper, and that just kind of checked the box for me of this is why this research is so important. And then COVID. So all of the schools shut down. And after my, I think I hit about 17 schools because I was going, going, going. And I had so many more that I wanted to see. And at that point in time, all of the people that I was supposed to meet with said, we're sorry, we're shut down. Basically, you're our last priority. Take care, bye bye <laughs> So I said, well, I think I have to change the trajectory of what I'm trying to do. And I found myself with mastery.org. And mastery.org, uh, was they were fantastic. It was really interesting to sit down with them and talk about how their students are, they're using their program to go to different schools, public, private, anywhere that will accept the methodology. And it was less about grades and more about seeing the process, hearing from the students, seeing a more of a portfolio, which when I look at that compared to a transcript, I was just blown away. I could almost see, I'm seeing Dr. Irene, if Dr. Irene was giving me her uh, portfolio, I could see what you're working on. I could see your passions and what you're doing versus if I just submitted a transcript that was filled with a bunch of letter grades. So with that said, um, with some support from some lovely individuals in this room, you know who I'm looking at. Um, they supported me in creating, with a handful of fantastic faculty members here, the Mastery Project. And our first go was all about how are we going to bring mastery, am I out of time? Oh, um, okay, okay, this is where my jersey is going to help out. So, um, basically what was happening is I looked everywhere and there was so much information about mastery learning, but there was not a ton about mastery instruction. So I said, what could we do to bring to the college the mastery project where we are really working on feedback practices and not just giving the feedback but requiring students to respond to that so it's a circle and they're becoming more intrinsically motivated about the process of learning in the classroom versus just I need that grade and I need to move on. And our faculty, we all, I mean I think there's so many people at this college that do a phenomenal job of relationship building and connecting and we want to do more with um, how do we get there? What are some action steps that we can really do to make the students more intrinsically motivated and succeeding versus just focusing on that grade or checking that box? So we are about to run cohort number two. Cohort number one was a bit of a disaster, but it was awesome because it was really, really a learning opportunity. And we were able to deconstruct and rebuild and it is, it's just turning into this amazing thing and we've opened it from just our uh, division to, to the division of learning this time. So we have 12 participants, faculty members that are starting this Friday and we are so excited. So thank you for allowing us this. I think it's going to really shift our mindsets about how we look at the assessment process at our college and I'm thrilled to be one of the people that get to spearhead it. So thank you so much. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Dr. Gambone, I just wanted to say that I love your passion your compassion, your ability to be empathic, uh, not only in the grading, but looking at every angle. That tells me that I love for me to be in your classroom one of the <laughs> days to get motivated as well. But it tells me that this not only, it was an incredible experience for you, but it's something that you will cherish for a while and be able to take with everybody else. So thank you so much for sharing that. And one of our students here is gonna also talk to us. Like, I think he's excited as well. Thanks, Connor. You want to take my classes? Come on. Yes. <laughs> so I was going to say, I'm actually studying to be a Spanish teacher. So oh, yes. Yes. Woo! So um, I just wanted, I just I really like your passion. And if you're teaching something this uh, spring, let me know. Gambone. Gambone. EU classes. You got it. I'm in so, there. So um, I, I think it's really interesting to see the, the, um, looking at the mastery of content versus just the letter grades. I think a lot of young people, they look at that number and that's their entire life. Yeah. But you need to make sure that you're understanding the content in the classroom that we're trying to get through. So I think you fit that masterfully. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Care. Certainly, Trustee Johnson. Is it possible that you can come back and tell us the result of the pilot and how yeah. implementing it on a broader group of students who, and, and doing some things in parallel? Yeah. So we, I'd be interested in knowing that. and. Thank you so much for your interest. I'd be honored to do that because, like, like I said, we after the first pilot, we really were able to deconstruct and, and figure out a whole new methodology with a, a real evaluation plan mm -hmm. and a five-year trajectory and how everything is kind of looking. And I think that has been really helpful. Um, and so after this cohort, when we present in, you're all invited. 
April 28th, you can come see the presentations. I don't know the time yet, to be determined, but yes, I would be happy to come and share how that goes. If I may make a brief comment here, um, congratulating both of these, um, both, uh, both Dr. Brown and Dr. Gambone on their fantastic presentations. Uh, the work that you've done on this makes us even, it encourages this board even more to want to allow people here to take these sabbaticals because of the work we're seeing come out of this. So I think everybody on this board was very impressed with what you both just did. And congratulations from all of us. And you know, you have a remarkable faculty. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you. I also want to share with the board that in order to break up the sabbatical so that you weren't having all of them on the same evening, we have two more presentations in November, so we wanted to break it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it really worked because you were able to really focus on the faculty yeah. that presented and really hear what they had to say, and, and their work was incredibly impressive. So. Madam President, I agree because you were able to enjoy it as a board member and really see the personalities of the faculty and enjoy it. I, I really, truly enjoy that, and um, both of the sabbatical well, Dr. Brown and Gordon Rabon just shows the level of caring they have and the passion. So thank you for doing that. And thank the board for supporting it. I can't say it enough because I know that we're very, very fortunate to have a board that does care about learning like this. And um, it really does benefit. And I think that's why we're the number one in the country. Yeah. With our faculty having the opportunity to be creative and, um, and in the classroom and enjoy this. And we've got a little support program as well. So yeah. we're in good shape. I don't know, Jan, this is a hard act to follow, but I'm gonna um, now ask uh, Dan Baum, our Executive Director from Strategic Communications to um, share with us his update. That is a hard act to follow. Dr. Gambone, did you check out Hampshire College by any chance? Hampshire College, my alma mater, no grades, all mastery. So good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you an overview of Strategic Communications and our current efforts to support the student journey. It's so nice to see you in person. And particularly for Trustee Yuvala, I've really pared this down to a tight 35, 40 minutes. This is, I'm just, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze through this. Um, but in all seriousness, with apologies to some of the board members, you may recognize pieces of this presentation, uh, but particularly for the newest board members, this is intended to give you a framework of how we approach communications here at the college. Uh, hopefully you find this helpful. So I'm gonna begin. Uh, by drawing on the strategic plan, our team primarily focuses on that entry piece, that first point of contact with our students, not exclusively, but, but largely. If you think of the student journey as a large, twisting road with various places along the way, we are right at the front end. We are providing those initial directional signs, inspiring imagery and messaging that encourages students to begin their venture with us. To do this, we practice a philosophy we called integrated marketing communications. And as the name implies, it's really just that all of our communications are integrated so that it's the same messaging and the same look and feel so that our students and our community begin to recognize it. To develop those communications, we practice what is referred to today in, by the acronym PESO, which I'm gonna just walk through very briefly in reverse order, starting with owned media. You can imagine a college of this size, we produce a lot of content and we have a lot of information and we produce it all in house in our office from print materials, which might be books or brochures such as the view book, which the admissions team largely uses reaching high school students, our magazine that we send out to the entire county twice a year. We offer a welcome packet for students when they apply, we send them a, a welcome packet so that it's comparable to a four-year university when they are applying there as well. Our team also has oversight for the, the content <clears throat> and the design of our website, which you can imagine during a global pandemic required a lot of updates. We even created a microsite. Given that many of us were spread out, we wanted to, to still have a sense of community, and so we created a, a digital site for that purpose. We also do digital animation within the team, and we are responsible for the overall style guide logos, which can be seen on banners, posters, pens, you name it. 
Uh, that's what our team does. So that's the owned media. Shared media really refers to the social media platforms available today, and there's so many, and we want to meet students where they are, whether they're on Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. It also allows us to focus on certain programs in certain parts of the college and the county. We can share experiences there, tell student stories, faculty stories, and we can even design imagery to go over photographs when students are celebrating various milestones. Earned media is about getting other people to tell our story, which is harder and harder today because there are fewer and fewer outlets. There aren't as many reporters, there are bloggers and things, but it's a challenge, so we're always pitching. We might find ourselves in the Washington Post, the Capitol, the Sun, what have you, but more and more we find that we're telling our own story on our newsroom and through the website and through social media. Perhaps the most comprehensive and time-intensive part of our responsibilities is the paid advertising. There are so many places that our students can be today, whether it's watching video, streaming video, streaming audio, searching online, digital advertising, even geofencing, which is creating like a virtual fence around a certain area where we can serve up ads, or retargeting when they visit our website and we retarget them. And yes, it is as creepy as it sounds, um, <clears throat> but it's extremely effective. And so our overall campaign, which is the Redefine Yourself campaign, tells the stories of individual students in their own voices through this, the different media, and then allows students to engage with those stories further. Throughout the year, we will provide updates on when the next classes start. We have campaigns specific to the different seasons. And then we direct them to different website pages, but particularly we've been adding the, a, a more prominent Apply Now button on different pages, and we've seen a huge increase in traffic to the applications page as a result of that. We also have micro or niche campaigns, such as the transfer campaign that focuses on the different ways that you can transfer to a four-year university from here, and that directs students to specific web pages. Skilled Trades Campaign, which has been funded through a grant funding, but it focuses on the Clawson Center and some of the skilled trade professions. So how do we know any of this is working? How do we measure it? And is it working? So I will answer that again by using the, str the strategic plan. These are the four key areas of the strategic plan. So looking at it from a resources standpoint, because we are so heavily digital today, we've been able to reallocate our funding and not request additional funds. It's extremely cost effective and just effective. We're able to get to a very granular level and look at every platform and every click, et cetera, and determine how effective it is. Innovation. So I mentioned TikTok. This is one of our newest platforms for us. If a, a year ago, I don't, we, we weren't on, a, a year ago we weren't on TikTok. We were debating whether we should be on TikTok. Is that a place for us? And clearly that's where students are. So I just give you a little taste of that. This is a compilation of ads. So this, these are all individual ads. which gives us the ability in six seconds to show the entire student journey from a specific high school to AACC and then to a specific college. So it's been a very effective medium for us. Thank you. That, that's the goal, that's the goal. Another way we measure is excellence. We're very pleased that we've received a number of awards nationally and regionally. We're particularly proud of the UCDA, which is the University Collegiate Design Association. This is largely made up of four-year colleges, which means we're up against not only the four-year college, but against ad agencies that work for these colleges. So we're one of the few community colleges to receive an award. And then in the district for us, which is really all of the Northeast, a couple, few of us were at the conference last week, we won seven awards. Six were gold, one was silver. Frankly, we were robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Should 
Should have been a clean sweep. <laughs> and then, of course, engagement, which is really the heart of the measurement that we're after. And we have seen an increase in web traffic clicks, visits to specific pages, but most importantly, an increase in new student applications, which is not just the applications, they have turned into new students. So we are up in new students. And this is where we hand it off to others. So we draw them in at that first point of entry. We are the spark that interests them. And then we pass along to admissions, advising, financial aid, and others who are then shepherding students into the classroom to work directly with our amazing faculty and support services. Again, all of this work is done in-house, what you've seen. And I am fortunate to work with a highly talented team, graphic designers, videographers, website content specialists, social media, PR, and marketing strategists whose work reflected here shows their ongoing commitment to continually learn and grow to serve our students and our community. Thank you. Any questions? Certainly. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for getting through that before 8 o'clock tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I was scared, Monica, with the number of slides. She almost had a heart attack. <laughs> I, I, read, I read all through the pre-reads uh, before the meeting. I said, there is no way Bob's going to get through that thing <laughs> without uh, me. I'm, I'm not from Jersey. I wasn't talking as fast as Dr. Gambone, but my wife is from New Jersey, so I was trying to keep the pace. Well, I, I, I applaud you. Uh, my son's uh, got a graphic design company, our old son, and, and uh, youngest works uh, in academia as well. And I let, shared some of this with them, and they applaud you. They, they think it's the kind of thing that would catch their eyes. So uh, Thank you. well done, and I appreciate you continuing to look for better ways to do it as well. Thank you. So I have a question. I, I think in the beginning, if you go back to the last slide, we talked about your impact being at the entry level. But I think there's an opportunity that should be looked at for students who are continuing. If I remember correctly, over the last two years, 50, per six, 50 to 60 percent of the students who started a year ago returned. So we're losing 40 percent or something. And that to me is, is very important because we've invested in those individuals. And all of a sudden, we got, they, they're gone. So it should be a place where your, your team can help to encourage more students to continue uh, their education here at AACC. Yeah, I appreciate the suggestion and, and the thinking there. If you recall that journey, there's so many pieces of that, and we do collaborate with different parts of the college at different times mm -hmm. uh, along the way. It's, the reason I say that entry is it's where we have the greatest control of just being able to reach them. At that, as the journey progresses, there are so many other factors it's really trying to narrow down what, because we focus on a singular message. And that's, a, that's the hard part, is where are they, where are we losing them? But it, we, you're absolutely right. That, that's exactly where the opportunity is next. Madam Chair, if I may. Certainly. Thank you. Um, so what, where's your air journey? You know, understanding that semantic of the student, where it is, where are you at that journey? It's very important to outline it not only marketing, but if you think about it, a lot of the students are afraid to come back to the classroom, some of them, not all. And if it's so, then the marketing has to come in such a way that allow them to see that the faculty that's out there is going to help them. So looking at Cal Chavia and bringing the faculty forward like you have in some of your marketing campaigns is really uh, important in the future because a lot of students are intimidated. They're gonna listen to the faculty when they see the faculty like we just heard a few minutes ago, their excitement, their ability to be interactive and compassionate and caring is gonna come afloat in such a way that students are gonna say, I wanna take a class in the classroom. Oh, absolutely, we would so, agree, absolutely. I, our, I think we would say that most people don't get community college until they experience it, but if they're afraid to experience it, then, then there's a catch-22. But the solution is showcasing our faculty, our programs, largely through video and then they can get a taste of it. So now, totally with agree. all the social media, which one you feel is like numero uno from all of it? You know, it varies by audience. Yeah. So it sort of depends. If we're talking the youngest, it would probably be TikTok. Um, we, we, we don't have to be TikTok to get a 
And interestingly, we can see the performance of different stories and different messages by platform as well. So it's hard to say singular just across the board. It really does vary by demographic. Yeah, and Kenji, that was my question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the demographics and how you target? So we, the only time we use outside help in, in agents, uh, an agency in particular is in the buying of our media. And so what we will share with them is these, this is the data we have on our students. We try to create personas or profiles <clears throat> so they have an understanding of the range. And particularly, under 25 is really the core number of students that we have. Now, we serve all students, but that's where you're going to see a large number. So we're going to start there. We also, want to, we also want to support admissions in their outreach to the traditional age, and then we have the non-traditional ages at different, different parts of their, of their journey. And we'll convey that to the uh, advertising um, partner that we have so when they buy the media, they're saying, well, for this audience, you want to be here. For this audience, you want to be here. And that's why there's, we're, we're, we're all over the place, is because there's so many different possibilities depending on who the audience is. And then we can track the data and actually see the performance by platform. So that's how granular it's gotten. So on, while on the one hand, it's just exploded with the range of possibilities, it's gotten very detailed that we can then track and see. So uh, uh, just as an example, a few years ago, we were heavy video but we didn't see as many clicks. And that's when we realized well, we need to adjust our strategy a little bit and increase the number of clicks because that's we want to drive the traffic to, to the uh, website and to drive applications. So we shifted our strategy and we saw explosive growth. So we're just constantly analyzing. So is it just age or do you also look at other populations? All, it's age, race, um, income, location within the county. I mean, we, we slice and dice every way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question. Um, Trustee Johnson referred to we get the students in for the first year and then we lose 40% before they come back for the second year. Are we including in that number, and Dr. Milner, this may be more of a question for you, are we including in that number students who only come here for a year to get like a one-year certificate? Is that all inclusive? So that would kind of skew that 40% a little bit. Okay. Okay. All right. But it, it all is inclusive, so that can be a little, you know, that could be a little, yeah, a little bit the word won't come out, but it's a little bit. <laughs> all right. So a little bit of something. Anyway. Um, Anyway, All right. anything else, Dan? Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice report. And um, Dr. Greg Schrader is um, taking our visitor back to the train station, and I believe, Dr. Milner, you're going to give us a report. I am not Dr. Schrader, not Dr. Claudia or Gregory. <laughs> this is a, a, a statement he, he asked me to read on his behalf. The steering committee would like to thank the Board of Trustees for meeting with Dr. Claudia Schrader during her visit today. We are excited to be approaching the final stage of the accreditation process. The steering committee is looking forward to receiving and integrating the feedback from Dr. Claudia Schrader after today's visit into the self-study report. The final report will be submitted to Middle States by the end of this semester. With the help of Dr. Johnson, the board has received background materials to help guide you through the accreditation process. Both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Greg Schrader are available to answer any questions you may have regarding the materials provided. The steering committee looks for, you notice how I pulled myself out of that <laughs> question answering part. The steering committee looks forward 
to working with the board as we approach the full team site visit March 12th through 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hill, I have here no report. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, Dr. Hill from Academic Forum slash Council, still no report? Okay. Um, administrative Staff Organization President Jill Bennett does have a report, I believe. Good evening and thank you, Dr. Lindsay. At our first meeting last month, the ASO welcomed our newly elected member at large, Dorothy Parrish Harris. Dorothy is the Director of Disability and Support Services and we are thrilled to have her on board. At our meeting, we also approved our goals for the year. They are formally outlined in my written report, but bottom line reflect a commitment to more interactive conversations during ASO general body meetings. Also, uh, more informal gatherings, such as the one we're holding tomorrow morning. So feel free to stop by the Ludlam building between 8.30 and 10 tomorrow for coffee and donuts. If you can't make it, then join us at The Point on November 10th between 4.30 and 6.00. We also will continue to encourage service on countywide committees as well as participation in mentoring and coaching. Speaking of coaching, did you know that five of the seven ASO officers are International Coach Federation trained life and leadership coaches? Go AACC coaching program. <laughs> and lastly, look for fr a friendly challenge between the divisions of learning, LRM, and LSS for percentage of ASO members participating in AACC's Help Link program. My money's on LRM. I hope my LRM friends will support me in that, but then I'm a little biased. And that concludes my report. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from our Student Government Association, President Abigail Golditz Tate. All right, hello everybody. Hi. <laughs> All right, the first thing I have is um, last week, SGA hosted an event called the General Forum where all the clubs, well, all the club leaders come and we, um, we uh, tell them what, what we're planning for the semester and then they come and do like a Q&A and we answer their questions. We had, I think, around 25, 26 clubs come, which was awesome. Um, we also just finished up our budget season. Basically, clubs will come to us and ask for money, and we'll assess their budget, and we'll see if we want to give it to them or not. So we've, <laughs> <laughs> so we've assessed almost all of the clubs. We have a few stragglers, but we are mostly done with that. Um, also. SGA elections for the fall are underway. We're currently looking for senators, and uh, we have one vacant vice president position that we're trying to fill. So that election opened this morning, and it'll run until next Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. Also, we have lots of events coming up this semester. We have a movie night planned later, later this month. The movie is going to be Nope, directed by Jordan Peele. So that's going to be pretty big. Um, we also have an event called Hocktail Hour, which is us partnering up with the, uh, with the Health and Wellness Center to help educate students about you know, drinking safely, along as some trivia nights and then also a holiday party at the very end of the year that will help educate students about different holidays while also participating in like, holiday foods and holiday activities of like different cultural winter holidays. And also, we were one of the groups that talked to Dr. Schrader. <laughs> we talked to her th this morning. We had a very delightful conversation. So I'm happy that that seemed to go well. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Nicole Williams, President. I have no report from the faculty organization. Is that still the situation? Yes. Okay. Um, then I'll move into the Maryland Association of Community College Activities, um, sharing with the board that the MAC Board of Directors will meet on October the 25th. They will be voting um, to approve the 2023 MAC legislative agenda, which I will actually be bringing to you next as an action item. The 10th annual MAC Summit, Bridging the Gap, Maximizing Transfer for Students, will be Friday, November the 4th at the Community College of Baltimore County, Catonsville. This event provides the opportunities for colleagues to share best practices 
And thus far confirmed speakers are Senator uh, Sarah Elfrich, uh, Dr. James Soda from MHAC, Secretary of Education, and uh, State Delegate Gerard Sullivan. So I'm bringing now in front of the board a request for approval of the MAC legislative agenda. I'm not gonna read through it. I will uh, list the topics um, that we're bringing forward related to the legislation. Um, our operating budget, our capital request, um, community college universal promise, the facilities renewal grant, and state reimbursement for mandated tuition waivers are the topics of the legislation. The item being brought in for, uh, forward tonight is the board is asked to approve the draft 2023 Maryland Association of Community Colleges legislative agenda. The draft 2023 agenda includes items for legislative action at the state level on issues that affect the well-being of Maryland's community colleges and the many thousands of students we serve. With the board's approval, the draft of the MAC uh, 2023 legislative agenda will require an affirmative cast uh, to vote um, in support of it. And that the main motion is that the Board of Trustees approve the draft 2023 MAC legislative agenda as presented in Exhibit 1. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? I have a question. Certainly. On uh, the facilities renewal management, third paragraph down, that paragraph, that sentence does not uh, fit nice with me. Currently, the annual appropriation is capped at either 5% of the community, community college capital grant program not to exceed $500,000 and is distributed to only eight. The idea is it's either or, but you never got an or. I'll take us back to Mac. I mean, everybody's looking at the same document. Okay. Um, so, so just, I guess, in your mind, do you know whether it's an or in there or whether the and is the proper? Uh, My understanding is we're asking and in support of each college getting five hundred thousand dollars. No, not Leslie. So my, I'll get you more information, but my understanding is that the request is that each of the colleges, because right now not everybody participates, right, I believe it's part of the issue, right. and that the goal is to get it up to the $500,000 for each community college. That's, I believe, where we're headed with this, because mm -hmm. some colleges are getting more, some colleges are getting less, some colleges aren't participating at all. So the word only is appropriate. Then. Well, it's increasing um, what's available, it looks like, from the 5% to the 10%. So with clarification, not that we're going to change it solely, but is it requested? It, it needs to be corrected. So I, I'd like to ask that the motion be with attention given to that one sentence. That's a, I guess that's the way to do it. I can do that tomorrow, no problem. I accept that. Uh, Friendly. Friendly amendment. Okay. Thank you. Or the eight. I'll have to get you the it's, it's, it's I'm six, not the top eight, of my head. Eight, 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 eight. We don't all get the same amount of money every year. It's every other year. Every other year. Okay. Are there any other questions? Any other discussion? I think we need to report back though if there's a separate question. I would be happy to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a clarification. I'll talk to Brad tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So I will have to say this is the only board that's picked this up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so congratulations. This well, is they, don't, they don't have a Dr. Johnson and a Dr. That's Chen. right. That's they true. Don't, they don't That's have true. them. They don't the know board. who they're coming up against. Yeah. <laughs> my Dr. colleagues are going to be, oh, my gosh, your board's at it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Dr. But Johnson, do you may have a – it's a good thing you sit together. You may have a colleague here in you, you know. We're on the same page about certain things already, so we just have to keep working <laughs> on it. <laughs> and, and this is the truth. We wonder why the, the administrators get – bottled water, and we get water from the faucet. <laughs> it seems like to me we need to move up in class. Okay, so we're going to explain. <laughs> we are going to explain our rationale. I think we're we, off topic. We, yeah, we are, but, but we're way this, off this topic. is obviously an issue that's really bothering Dr. Johnson. So please, it's not it the is. first time I'm hearing this. So, Monica, correct me if I'm wrong. The goal was to give you crystal goblets, which are glass, and pitchers, so you would have as much as you would like to pour, thinking that it looks nicer on the table than the bottle. Oh, is that right? 
Okay. So it was done thoughtfully. Right. It's certainly more ecologically. <laughs> it is. Correct. I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry to have digressed, Madam Chair. <laughs> and, and Melissa, how can I answer yes. for us on your question already, possibly? Melissa. I will be back with everybody by tomorrow at 5. Okay. Trustee Uvula has accepted the friendly amendment to this. Um, so let's proceed with the vote. Amanda, would you call the roll to approve or disapprove, please? Trustees, when I call your name, please state your vote. Chair Moore? Approve. Vice Chair Uvula? Approve. Trustee Chen? Approve. Trustee Johnson? Approved. Trustee Price Jones? Approved. Trustee Stanton Buttram? Approved. Trustee Zoppy Rodriguez? Approved. Trustee Curran? Approved. Thank you. Chair Moore, this motion passes. Thank you very much. Do I hear any new business to bring before the board? Hearing none, this meeting stands adjourned. Our next meeting will be November 8th, 2022. Thank you for attending. <laughs>